I'm Axel Ringa with the Tennessee chapter of the Sierra Club. And this is an overview of what fracking is. The process a natural gas company will go through to establish a producing well. Shit. <laughs> First, they will go in and lease the land, usually in large, large chunks. Then they will go in and do a seismic survey. Acquire the necessary federal and state permits. Then they will construct the well site pad and access roads. <coughs> then they'll go in and drill the, drill the well. Then they'll fracture it. Um, usually a given well is fracked multiple times. They don't just do it once. They go back in and do it up to a dozen times. Then they do what they call the completion process, which is putting in all the, uh, the valves and pipes and other associated um, infrastructure for that well. And, uh, hook it up to a collecting pipeline, they'll market the gas, and finally, when they're done with it, they will restore the site. That's what they say. That's what they say. This is a representation of a well fracturing as the industry would like us to see it. Um, they drill down multiple thousands of feet, um, the well bore does a 90 degree turn in the uh, formation that they want to extract the gas from. Then they will frack it down there and extract the gas. And as you see in the blow up here, the blue is supposed to be an aquifer, which they show as being way up here and far, far removed from where the fracking occurs. Um, this is a slightly different representation that we feel is more realistic. Um, you have the fracked well, it goes down through the aquifer into the formation and is here fracked. And the fractures that they create are capable of reaching into an aquifer. Uh, the crosshatched areas are areas where you get methane leakage and fracking fluid leakage into the aquifers and into the atmosphere. Um, and when the gas comes up here, there's a potential for leaking through faulty casing. Um, comes up here, uh, there are trucks, there are uh, compressor stations, there are the waste ponds, there are the, the tanks that hold the, the gas, the, trucks so that take it to wherever it needs to go. Um, here we have a drinking well that is contaminated with methane. You can put a match to and light it. Um, these are all areas that are subject to leakage of methane and chemicals. This is another picture and what this, this shows is what the industry does not want us to, to realize is that the rock formations that supposedly contain the fracked area are not impermeable. All rock formations that I'm familiar with, and I am a geologist, have existing fractures in them, have faults in them, have joints in them, all of which are subject to letting methane pass along through them and through them up to aquifers and potentially even up to the land surface. Okay, that's a picture of 
picture of site preparation for a well pad. Um, it's not exactly a, a kind, gentle approach. Uh, most of these well pads run four, four or five up to 10 acres, depending on the size that they want. That's a completed well field. This one is out west, so you have a good view of all the well pads and the access roads. It essentially turns the landscape into an industrial zone. And this is what it looks like here in the east, where we have forest cover. You have the same thing, but it's not quite so visible from the ground, but from the, from the air you can see all the access roads connecting to various well pads. And so you have the same effect. You have, and in this case, you have forest fragmentation, you have damaged wildlife habitat, um, you have the potential for leaks, spills and leakage into streams. And again, you have a natural landscape turned into an industrial zone. That's a completed well pad, all neat and tidy. That's a well pad that is, has been partially reclaimed and is just sitting there producing gas. Um, <laughs> public disclosure of fracking fluids, it doesn't happen. Um, the, com the companies that produce this stuff and sell it to the the drilling companies um, like to say that at least some of their stuff is proprietary and that it's trade, it's trade secrets. There is a website called frackfocus.com that has been set up as a voluntary way for companies to uh, communicate to the public what chemicals they are using in their fracking fluids. Um, but again, they don't, they don't list the stuff that is proprietary and it's not exactly being used 100% by everybody. Uh, no Tennessee company that is engaged in natural gas here has anything on that website. That's one of the other little side effects of natural gas extraction is flaring. If they have an excess of gas that they can't either bring to market or they're not set up yet to, to store, uh, they simply will flare the gas off. In some ways, that is a lesser of two evils rather than just pumping pure methane into the atmosphere. They're burning it and pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, methane, as you probably know, is about 25 times uh, more effective as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, so I guess the companies are doing us a favor by flaring it. But for people that live in close proximity to these sites, those flares sound like a jet engine at close range. So if you're living next to that, it's not real pleasant for you. That's a waste pond. Um, it is lined. Um, lining specifications and the regulations tend to be a little loose usually. And even if they are specified, they're not exactly what I would, they're not nearly as impervious as what I have lining my fish pond. Um, they are usually uncovered, so wildlife and migratory birds and whatnot can mistake it for clear water and will land in it and drown. Um, wildlife can come in, try drinking out of it. Um, it's open to the air, so any of the volatile chemicals that came out of that well uh, can evaporate into the atmosphere. And if there is a severe storm event, 
Um, there's obviously nothing to prevent that from overflowing and heading into the nearest stream. Uh, and they are usually required to periodically pump those ponds out and take the wastewater to some place for treatment. Uh, they used to just take it to the nearest sewage treatment plant until it was discovered that sewage treatment plants can't handle this stuff. Um, in Tennessee now, um, they're required to take it to deep injection wells and pump it back down underground, usually uh, greater than 10,000 feet down. I have heard that there is, in Arkansas, there is a new uh, process that has been developed where they use reverse osmosis and clean the stuff up that way and discharge it into the local streams. Um, I have no idea how well that works. That's just to catch your attention. Um, radiation is becoming an issue. The formations, the black shale formations that contain the gas um, also tend to contain uh, uranium. Um, it's a geochemical phenomenon. They're, these black shales sort of attract uranium atoms uh, like a magnet and concentrate them there. When a well is fracked, uh, the fracking fluid is capable of dissolving some of those that uranium, so it will come back up in the wastewater. It will also get into the, the gas itself, um, which is then pumped up and into your houses. Uranium-238 itself is not that big a deal, um, radioactively speaking. Uh, however, radium-226, is a big deal, it's very toxic. Um, it is both, it is an alpha, beta, and gamma emitter. So it not only is a problem if it's ingested or breathed in, but it is a problem if you're even exposed to it externally. Um, radium-226 then decays into radon-222 which is a gas, it's a heavier than air gas, that will be a constituent of the natural gas that is coming into people's homes. And radon it will be breathed in, and it is an alpha emitter, so any tissues or cells that it, it comes into contact with will be damaged by it. Radon is, has a very short half-life, and it decays to polonium-210, which is a solid. Um, it is what is referred to in the, uh, amongst those in the physics, as a bone seeker. It is an alpha emitter. It will travel through your bloodstream and be adsorbed onto your bones and will cause cancer. Um, if any of you have followed the tobacco uh, controversies some years ago, polonium-210 is a constituent of tobacco smoke, <laughs> which is one of the reasons that tobacco smoke is so carcinogenic. The well pads themselves are not the only disrupting uh, influence. This is a collecting pipe that they have to bury in the ground. They have to clear these corridors. Um, it's heavy construction in rural or natural areas. This is a picture of the major natural gas producing formations in the country. Um, that's the Marcellus Shale up here that everybody's heard about. Uh, the Marcellus Shale does extend down into this area where it becomes known as the Chattanooga Shale. 
Uh, Chattanooga shale in Tennessee is a primary target right now. It is a fairly shallow formation. Um, it runs from anywhere from 5,000 feet deep um, on the east side to less than 200 feet on the, on the western <coughs> edge of it. Um, Chattanooga shale is also what they consider a dry formation. Uh, so water-based tracking doesn't really work very well in it. Uh, so the company, companies that are extracting the gas here use what they call nitrogen fracking. Um, they prepare, it's, it's a nitrogen foam. They combine the nitrogen gas with uh, some, uh, some gels that turn it into a foam, then they pump it down and frack it. They say this is a much kinder uh, and more environmentally benign way of fracking. What they don't tell you is that even the nitrogen fracking does use water as well. Um, they use just under 200,000 gallons per frack. And as I think I said earlier, they will frack a well up to about 12 times because that horizontal leg, which can run out about 1,200 feet, uh, they don't frack it all at one time. They frack it in pieces. Uh, yeah, that's all for that. Uh, that's a better picture of the extent of the Chattanooga Shale in Tennessee. There is another formation underneath the Chattanooga called the Utica, which is at a far greater depth. Uh, it's not all that much of it, but it does come down here. And when they get finished with the Chattanooga Shale and when gas prices get up high enough, they will be attacking that formation as well. These are some of the problem areas that we run into with fracking. Um, we've got most of the recorded incidences across the country so far have been caused by leaks in the casing or pipes. Um, this is something that we tried to address here in Tennessee when they were revising their oil and gas regulations. We tried to persuade um, the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, TDEC, to put in place into the regulations the uh, American Petroleum Institute standards for casing, because we thought those were actually fairly robust, as far as that goes, even though, even though they were industry promulgated. Um, TDEC chose not to accept, not to, uh, accept them. Uh, they wanted something looser with more flexibility. Uh, methane migration is a problem. Um, you get that around the casing or pipes. You get that from the frack formation itself going up into the aquifers. Um, get leaks in the waste pits and from the liners in the ponds. Um, in Tennessee, the regulation requires a pond liner that is about the thick thickness of your average trash bag. You get spills from the transportation. They have to bring the water in to frack the well by truck. So you've got a lot of truck traffic coming in. They take the wastewater out by truck. So you've got a lot of truck traffic with potential spills from the trucks going in and out. Um, you could have spills from the well site itself. One thing I didn't mention as far as methane migration is concerned, uh, we've had people here in Tennessee that have gone out to visit well sites, sort of unofficially, and what they have found is that a lot of them leak like sieves from the piping, from the valves, from the connections between the valves. You can just put your ear down to the pipes and you can hear the stuff hissing out. Um, a recent study that was nationwide determined that up to 9% of the methane produced from wells is lost to the atmosphere. Did you say 9 or 9? 9. 9%. Nine. 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 Um, and again, 
again, you have stormwater overflow from your waste pits. You have site erosion uh, from storm events. Um, so you have sedimentation going into the streams and wetlands. You have fuel spills from the operations. <coughs> All of the equipment at these sites, ranging from the trucks to the compressor stations to the drilling equipment, is diesel powered. And that stuff runs 24 hours a day. And finally, you have the radon that I talked about just previously. These are the key environmental issues. You know, water withdrawals out west, that's becoming a real problem because they're use, using several million gallons of water per frac. And the west doesn't have that much water to begin with. Some areas are running dry. The people's drinking wells are drying up. And towns and cities are finding that they're going to having to fight the gas industry for their water supplies. Um, here in Tennessee, uh, most of the gas industry uh, activity is on the Cumberland Plateau, which does not have any major rivers. It does not have any large reservoirs. So water for the people that live there is taken up by drinking water wells or from streams. Uh, it's a karst topography. Which you know what that is, a case underground. So water that comes down from rainfall uh, is rapidly sucked into the caves and is not stored. So there is a potential water shortage on the Cumberland Plateau from fracking operations if they really get going big time in Tennessee. Um, there's an issue with the wastewater treatment and disposal. There is no good way of treating this stuff other than injecting it back into deep formations. Um, ground and surface drinking water, um, you have a contamination problem, um, you have the problem with water supply from the drift withdrawals. Uh, protecting our streams, um, this area, the southern Appalachians and the Cumberlands, is a global biodiversity <coughs> hotspot, particularly for aquatic organisms. Um, contaminating those streams with fracking fluids or other hydrocarbons, petroleum products, diesel spills, what have you, is not going to be healthy for the aquatic organisms that live in those streams. Uh, again, forest fragmentation, this is a cumulative effect. The more of these things you have in an area and the more access roads and collecting pipelines that sort of web the area, the more that forest is going to be fragmented and the less um, inviting it is going to be for critters that like to live there. Um, one of our poster childs here is a cerulean warbler, which requires large blocks of unfragmented forest to breed in. Um, once you, and you saw the picture that I showed you of the overhead, you have a situation like that. You're not going to get cerulean warblers coming back to breed here. Um, the roads, the pipelines, and compressors. I was talking to a, a reporter yesterday about that, and one of the issues with this is dust generation from all the truck traffic to people that live by here. We have a fairly substantial problem with asthma as it is, and filling the air with dust from these operations does not help the children that live in those areas. Um, Long-term consequences, cumulative impacts. Um, we know the Obama administration and Congress are all hell-bent on producing gas as quickly and as extensively as they can because they're calling it, quote, a bridge fuel and energy independence. It's neither of those things. Um, all it is doing is substituting our coal crutch with a, a natural gas crutch. Both of them are contributing to global warming and the accelerating trends there. So long-term consequences are more and better of what we're starting to see already. 
um, air quality impacts, both from the particulates, the dust, um, from the methane, and from the other volatile compounds that escape from these operations, um, some of which are directly toxic, some of which simply add to the smog problems. Uh, we have a lack of monitoring, enforcement, and inspection. In Tennessee, we have two and a half inspectors to cover the entire state. Our regulations, which I and a number of other people and allied organizations worked on with TDEC for over three years, are, how would you describe that, Detlef? Insufficient. <laughs> Insufficient, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's a very diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> Written by the gas industry, basically. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the problem with federal exemptions. And these are the federal laws that the gas industry is exempt from. The Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RCRA. But those ten cover Superfund sites. Uh, Safe Drinking Water Act. The Clean Water Act. Clean Air Act. National Environmental Policy Act, otherwise known as NEPA, and the Toxic Release Inventory, the Community you, Right Dick to Know Cheney. Act. Excuse me? I said, thank you, Dick Cheney. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. I'm sorry I sort of you, ran through that. I was trying to make up some time. Can you put that, back <laughs> part, that last one back up? Sure can. Do we have that? There was a handout on the table. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. So that's yeah. on the table. Uh, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Francis. Follow up on, on, on uh, Cheney did all these exceptions. I know the Drinking Water Act and, and Clean Water Act came from Mr. Cheney, but did all the others uh, exemptions come into being during that time? I believe so, yes. All of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure Joe. Axel, uh, going back to your first slide, uh, what uh, what is it about land that, what sort of uh, prior investigation do this, does the company do to know whether or not they want to lease a parcel of land and then do their seismic survey? It looks like they would do the seismic survey first and then lease the land. So what, what do they do before they lease land? That, you, you would think the seismic survey would come forth, but that doesn't seem to be the pattern. Um, I know that Atlas Energy recently uh, leased um, some, I think, 750,000 acres down in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, they obviously didn't do any seismic surveys. They did that. I think they look at geologic maps where there are, where they know that these formations extend to, and use that to target them. And then once they have the leases, then they can go in and do their seismic surveys to pinpoint where they want to put their wells. And what kind of compensation are they offering landowners to lease their land? Uh, as little as they can get away with. I mean, that's a private contract between the company and the landowner. In, in some cases, it's as little as $40 a year uh, per well. I'm in Texas right now in the barn out. But your surveys come from the United States Geological Survey, and we're having these airplanes fly over from where I'm at, surveying for the frac sand to be extracted, to be sent for the fracking. So these are coming from the United States Geological Surveys that these companies uh, buy into to, to get these uh, surveys to find out where the shell basins are. Yeah, sure. So yeah. their own government that's uh, providing the maps. Yeah, state agencies also yeah. have their own geologic, yeah. geology departments and their own set of maps. Is there any federal nexus for fracking projects in Tennessee? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is there any federal nexus for fracking projects in Tennessee? Do they need any federal permits or do they get any federal funding? No. <laughs> Could you repeat those questions? Uh, the question was, are there any federal permits for 
gas gas operations in Tennessee? And basically, no. I mean, they just they they do they they apply to the state agency, which in this case is a, a branch, a division of TDEC, for a a well permit. And once they get that, which is basically a rubber stamp, um, they're free to go ahead and do what they want to do. Yes? Um, I may not know what I'm talking about, so if anybody else knows, then please change it. But I don't think they have to get a well permit until it's over a certain size, and the size limit they set was so out there that they don't have to get a permit to start fracking, I think. But well, yeah, I think you're you're confusing something. Okay. Um, they do have to get a permit for every well. Okay. What I think you're referring to is what we call here the uh, the 200,000 gallon threshold trigger in Tennessee. If, according to the current regulation, if a company intends to frack a well using less than 200,000 gallons of water, they are not required to disclose to the public what the chemicals are or whether that well is even being fracked. Now, if they exceed that trigger, go over 200,000 gallons, then there is a public disclosure provision in the regulation that says they have to at least tell TDEC what they're doing and what they're using. Um, but the catch in that is that in Tennessee, because they use primarily nitrogen, because of the shallowness of the formations, they don't exceed 200,000 gallons. <laughs> so they don't, that, that never comes into play. Up and back there. That is per frack. Yes, sir. What is the process for coal bed methane production? Is it also involved in fracking? I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, it's my understanding that in West Tennessee there is a potential for coal bed for coal bed methane fracking. Um, we have a lot of it coal. Now. Coal obviously contains methane in a lot of instances as well, as we all know from underground mine explosions that happen periodically. Um, coal beds are generally fairly shallow, so I, it would be like extracting methane from a, from a landfill. Um, you go in, basically uh, frack the coal formation, uh, run some pipes down, and collect the methane coming out of it. So it, it does involve fracking. It's a more efficient way of getting the gas out, yes. When you said there's like two and a half inspectors for the entire state of Tennessee, is that, is that like literally the entire state has that number of personnel? That's the entire state. TDEC employs two full time and one part time inspectors to cover the entire state, yes. Do you know if the Knoxville Field Office? Right. I'm sorry? Do you know if the Knoxville Field Office has one of those positions? Or are they all based? Uh, they're, all, they're all out of the Knoxville field office. All, all, all two and a half of those? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much practice goes on? Actually, one of those is a female, so it's not just men. It's an equal opportunity. And Francis? Since Allegheny National Park is <coughs> so heavily fracked, I read somewhere 4,000 wells in Allegheny. Does the shale extend under Cherokee or Great Smoky Mountains National Park? No, it does not. It's a diff different geological area. Do you have a number of how many wells that have gone over 200,000 in Tennessee? Could you repeat Two. the question in each language? Uh, she asked me if I knew how many wells in Tennessee had gone over 200,000 gallons of water. And I said two. Um, could you tell us uh, what the Conestoga formation refers to? 
and also uh, comment on, in North Dakota, the Bakken having been fracked and they're finding that that was a great way to get oil and shifting away from natural gas to oil, and do we need to fear oil fracking in all these places? Okay. Um, as far as I am aware, the Conestoga Formation is mostly in Alabama, right here. It doesn't extend to any appreciable extent into Tennessee. Um, uh, the Bakken, Bakken is up around here somewhere. Just under the X in the uh, XLO you have straight down from the X, uh, right yeah. on the Canadian border. Yeah. Um, a lot of these formations contain not only natural gas but they also contain contain oil and natural gas liquids. Um, that's, that's a differentiation between what they call a wet formation and a dry formation. And I've read the newspaper accounts as well. Um, in, the, in some of these areas, uh, like the back end, they're finding that the gas production declines fairly quickly. Uh, but the oil is also there, and they're finding it much more profitable to concentrate on extracting the oil. Yes? Um, I had heard that they're uh, considering uh, tar sands mining in Alabama and Kentucky. Where would, do you know where that is? Or what I do not know specifically, no. Um, it's, I know in Kentucky it's in southern Kentucky, somewhere around here. Could you repeat that question each time, please? Sorry. Uh, she asked uh, if I knew where the tar sands operations in Kentucky and Alabama, and Alabama were. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.